episode 607. It's great to be back with you today and to share another inspiring and uplifting conversation about the healing power of plants and the ability of flowers to nurture us, body and soul. My guest today is botanist turned farmer florist, Kate Waters of Arizona's Wild Heart Farm. I first met Kate several years ago through the community of florists and flower farmers in Arizona, where I often visited my parents who were living outside of Phoenix. Kate and I connected through her frequent collaborator, Terry Shewitt, owner of Happy Vine Flowers, a Prescott Valley area florist who's also part of the Soul Flowers movement. The women produced a beautiful styled shoot that we published in Florist Review in December of 2019, and I've secretly always wanted them to team up for a desert-inspired botanical botanical couture piece for American Flowers Week. That hasn't happened yet, but I'm still wishing. Kate has an extensive background in botany, ecological restoration, and agriculture, coming to floristry while establishing a flower and herb garden at Orchard Canyon on Oak Creek, a 10-acre destination resort where she used to work in Sedona. She transitioned to flower farming full-time, when she and her partner, Mike Knapp, found a unique property in Rimrock, Arizona. They knew it could become the heart and home for both of their personal and professional endeavors. As Kate says, after 20 years in the field and wilds of botany and conservation, she wanted nothing more than to grow fields of flowers. Now at Wild Heart Farm, Kate calls her approach to plant-based products and programs floral healing. Plants have so many qualities that bolster emotional and mental wellness, she explains. I invited Kate to share more in today's conversation. The second part of this episode features a 12-minute video tour of Wild Heart Farm, which Kate filmed to give us a closer look at this special destination in the high desert. Let's jump right in and get started, and I'll share our sponsor thank yous at the end. Well, hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Soul Flower Show with Deborah Prinzing. Today, I am so delighted to welcome Kate Waters. Hi, Kate. Hi, Deborah. It's so great to see you on the screen. I wish oh, we were in so, person. So good to see you, too. Kate is the owner of Wild Heart Farm in Rimrock, Arizona. And um, I have not been to her farm, but I've been to some of the other places where she's uh, grown in the past. So, Kate, tell us uh, about Wild Heart, and uh, what inspired you to name your business that, and what is the business? Uh, how do you describe it? Okay, well, our farm, Wild Heart Farm, is in Rimrock, which is uh, about a 40 minutes southeast of Sedona. Okay. We're near Montezum as well, and Beaver Creek is our watershed, and uh, what in, it's a one acre farm and we farm about a quarter acre of our neighbor's property. So wow. we are a very small but mighty farm. And um, I think what inspired me to name the farm that is a twofold because one is I was a botanist for about 15, 20 years before I became a flower farmer and I worked in the conservation field. So my first love are wildflowers and wild landscapes. Mm. And this farm is incredibly wild. Mm. It's in a riparian woodland, which is a very rare habitat for Arizona. We have towering ash trees that are over a hundred years old. They are form a huge canopy. We have mulberries. Um, it's incredibly, we have a, a rock face, like we're on the, this uh, rock cliff that is limestone. And um, we have a lot of hackberry trees. We have just, yeah, it's, and then coyotes are oh my gosh. forming a symphony every night. <laughs> we have owls. And because it's such a productive place, um, and so it really does kind of pay homage to that side of myself and I think the side of, of, hum, of, of plants that, mm. and humans that mm -hmm. we all really long to be wild. You know, mm. we, we hit like a stasis when we, our roots are at the edge of the pot, you know, our roses <laughs> ramble, you know, and we want to spread our seed. We want to like, you know, get a little bit um, loose and just follow that thread that we had when we were children. And I, you know, I grew up climbing trees, you know, blowing dandelion seeds and milkweeds in the fields, you know, and so that's, that's what I, uh, and I think that's what our mission is really is mm -hmm. 
that we're, we are a flower farm, but we also, our mission is a little bit deeper in that we want to connect um, and people with the beauty and wisdom of nature and nourish, have our flowers nourish, nourish both body and, and soul, mm. um, uh, you know, with their beauty. So mm. yeah. I love that imagery that you just gave, you know, usually people are anthropomorphizing plants, but you did the opposite. You gave humans a plant trait. Like when we hit the point and our roots are, are, are like root bound and we're trying to jump out of the edge of the pot. I just love that imagery. Um, it's just, <laughs> it's the botanist in you. You're describing how plants behave and you're attributing those traits to humans. So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And I think, you know, as a, as a plant's person, as a horticulturist, as a botanist, a plant lover, I mean, we can't help but take so much joy and wisdom and I mean honest to, to goodness resilience and the mm -hmm. will that plants have to live I mean I I I torture my plants sometimes beyond what I think is possible and they still can like live sometimes and I just well, think yeah. you know and it's a you're testament. in a you're in a challenging landscape I mean when you talked about being in a riparian forest that isn't really what people think of when they think of Arizona. So right. is so that we, what drew, drew you to that land or how did that come about? Well, I mean, honestly, I think it must've been my karmic, you know, life that I was supposed to live because I had, you know, been farming for five years and I was an itinerant farmer, farming in different places, people's backyards at, you know, other venues, you know, being hired as a gardener, doing consulting, and um, really started to long for a place to root down, feeling like I have completed my apprenticeship. I'm ready to make my own mistakes. <laughs> and, <laughs> right. you know, and so I really started, we started longing. And then my partner and I, we started really mind mapping what it was that we were looking for. And we found, you know, uh, ran into a friend at a potluck and she you know, she's a real estate agent and she said, oh, you know, that's, that's, that's fine. I would love to help you find a place, but we had, you know, so she, she's like, I have the place for you. And she took us around, but it wasn't the place, but then it took, you know, that seeing the places that we thought we might want and, and then, you know, essentially mapping it out. And the things we didn't map out were like how many acres or any of that. It was just that we want water, we want shade, you know, we want community and we want peace and, you know, and we want a place that we can grow um, and we can both have our businesses because my partner is a naturopathic doctor and also a mindfulness meditation instructor. And so we kind of envisioned that the land would be a retreat, you know, right, of right. Sorts. A, a healing place, a healing place. And so uh, then I said to Heather, oh my God, it was the middle of the growing season. I can't do this anymore. We've got to, I got to keep, you know, working my gardening job but then she's like I got the place for you and literally the minute we walked across this land it was just mm. it was perfect you know and it was October all the leaves were changing and as soon as we got here it was like oh it, there's an offer in on it so mm. you know so we had to wait almost two months before we came back around and we were granted the land oh so wow we dropped wow. out so it was meant to be, but um, I think honestly, you know, to me, because I worked for 15 years killing tamarisk in the Grand Canyon. I mean, literally, I was like leading these armies of volunteers to protect, you know, riparian areas. And so I find it ironic that now I'm a steward of one. So mm, I love it. That's amazing. Yeah. So this micro farm that you have, of course, it also is home to your partner's business and you do on-farm events. So it's really um, like an intimate relationship you have with this parcel. And also it sounds like you're farming on another piece of land. What are you growing and how did you even get it established? Had it Had there been agriculture there before or... We were very fortunate. The people that we we inherited it from, you know, we bought it from were also they were growing. They had like a hobby farm. And so there was a high tunnel. There was a raised bed garden that wow. has like 12 beds that were already built, like four by eight beds. Um, there were some orchard trees, like a handful of orchard trees and 
Um, and then, you know, a little Barbie greenhouse, you know, like one of those uh, ones <laughs> from, from, you know, that everyone says, don't buy those. <laughs> the little kit. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, we, and then essentially sheds, like this is my she shed, which is kind of like my, you know, my female, you know, it's like my retreat, you know, where my creative space. Um, but then we had a shed that we turned into a cool bot. Wow. Um, so another blank shed. Um, and then there was a, sh a shed, but it was like basically a glorified shed. It's, it's Mike's man cave, which he <laughs> turned in his office. And so he has, you know, he can see his um, clients on, basically he sees clients online here and then he has a clinic in Flagstaff. Mm, so mm -hmm. he only has to commute two days a week, I see. but you know, he's like, he grew up want, like his dream was to have a library. Well, now he has a place to put all his books. <laughs> So it. <laughs> it's like we all won, you know, the lottery, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, there's, of course, there was no irrigation, um, you know, all, all the things, you know, that you yeah. go through when you first, but we got the farm in spring of 2020. And then, of course, COVID. Wow. What a so, place to hang out, though, during the pandemic, it right? It really was. I mean, we were sheltering on a beautiful ship, you know, yeah. um, Earth ship. And we yeah. were so lucky. And it really helped us really bond with the land and in some ways helped me start out slower. Because, That's true. Yeah. Um, my events were canceled and, you know, I had to start by just rooting and growing and that's actually we were we got a ten thousand dollar grant from the u.s fish and wildlife service to create pollinator habitat and honest to goodness that was that was the project for that year so that was the first plantings that you did then yeah i mean wow. we planted the high tunnel and i planted the raised beds and you know, that was a lot, you know, and then my sister got stranded here um, because through COVID, because she was planning to go back out east with our family and she, she was a te she's a teacher. So she got stuck here. And then it just now it's her regular summer vacation is to come here. And we're here. So you talked about your events um, being postponed or canceled prior to this move to your land in Rimrock, you had a business called Agave Maria, which I also really love the name. Yeah. That's when I first met you when you joined Slow Flowers and you really were focused on wedding and event design, um, some growing, but your, your, most of your creative uh, business was producing weddings and designing flowers for weddings and events. Is that correct? That is. Yeah. yeah. So that's how, I mean, I felt like that was a really good way for me to start was you know, doing weddings. And I just did a handful of weddings, maybe like eight to 10 weddings a year. And I was working at a farm to table venue and I was the gardener. So they allowed, you know, I actually got the chef really involved in edible flowers and he got me involved in like growing really awesome, you know, herbs and like the weirdest foods and the, you know, the really fun chefy things that, and, and the high, high heat chilies, things now that I can't live without. Oh, I love it. So, you know, so then I was like, oh, this is great. I'm working at a wedding venue. Why don't I just try this out? So I was able to really dip my toe into that and, um, and recruit my friend, Terry, who we worked at Whipstone together as interns. And we, you know, so we just, I, and I literally had a shed and, you know, and a refrigerator and I, you know, did weddings for wow. uh, three years like that. Um, wow. Starting what a great, just, yeah. What a great introduction to have this, a bit of a, like a, a support system to, launch this chant part of your creative creative process I love it it's prepared you for what you're doing now yeah and I, I I think I always had an idea that I would love to have my own farm but that was part of it was realizing you know working at a place and then having to commute every day and um you know it's just that's really challenging I mean yeah. just the dream is to wake up you know with your coffee and and go out and <laughs> Although rarely yes. it's like my coffee's cold. Corner post somewhere. And I'm already like, what did I, what was I doing? I'm so I know. I, that's how I feel about garden tools. They're all over the place. Um, how far was it? What well, was that commute or for you now in Rimrock, roughly how far is it from where you were located earlier? Were you closer to Sonoma? 
Or Sedona. Um, yeah, yeah, we were closer. So we were in Oak Creek Canyon, which is another beautiful riparian area and a canyon. Um, so that was a fabulous place to grow. And um, that's about an hour north of here, but you have to drive all the way through Sedona to get there. Oh, uh -huh. um, and then you have to wind up the canyon. So that was another reason I, you know, I mean, I kind of went cold turkey and I just quit my job and I wasn't planning to start a business. You know, I mean, I had my wedding business, but I wasn't start planning to like start a farm and quit my job. I thought I'd kind of keep doing that. But then I realized there's no way I could take care of an acre, have a flower design business and, you know, go and take care of all of these, you know, places. Garden, garden over an hour away. Yeah. I love that. Uh, the reason I asked about the book proximity is it sounds like your market really hasn't changed. You're still serving this greater area of people who come for weddings and events to this lovely area of Arizona, the Sedona Canyon. Is it a canyon? Sedona and like Oak Creek Canyon and then Flagstaff. I still mm -hmm. actually, there are quite a few wedding venues in Flagstaff as well that mm -hmm. I work with. And wow. yeah, it's been a little bit of an adjustment. I think anybody who has, you know, made this, you know, trek where you've started a new community and you're farming in a new town uh, it's challenging. I mean, yeah. I lived in uh, Flagstaff for 25 years, so that's where my people are. Yeah. And when, you know, when you're growing and you're selling, I mean, that's how you get your word out, you know? So, and then during COVID, it was hard to kind of get the word out here. And I think it still is, I'm still learning how to do that, you know, mm. to reach my neighbors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you talked about um, Terry, our friend from, from Happy Vine, and Terry is also a Slow Flowers member. You guys have collaborated on a lot of design projects. I remember we published one of your styled shoots in Florist Review. Um, well, that was what, maybe in 2018 or 2019. Mm -hmm. And it was so great to see how you interpreted local flora, you know, through... The, the desert, basically, the desert landscape. Yeah. And Terry, you know, Terry is such an ally and she's really my, I mean, she's my head floor. I mean, head florist, you know, when I need, <clears throat> you know, I mean, like the other day I, she came and did a wedding and she was like, received whatever flowers we were getting from other places, whipped out five bridal book, you know, bridesmaids <laughs> bouquets. And, you know, she's just, she's a professional, you know, cause mm. she, but she's also, you know, her heart and soul is a gardener and yeah. we're, you know, and, and actually all the women on my team are like that. Mm. So, um, mm. they are multifaceted. I have, you know, another woman who is a, you know, who is a gardener and she grows a lot of cactus and succulents and Terry does as well. And, um, and then my apprentice, Sarah is a school gardener and, um, you know, working with, you know, getting kids, you know, schools, and she's also a chef. So we really like bring all of that together. Like when I'm doing any event, it's like Sarah's bringing eucalyptus from her yard, Terry's bringing hellebores, Danny's bringing succulents and, you know, and it's just really cool. It's all coming know? together. And then Whipstone Farm, you know, I still buy flowers from Whipstone when I need, uh, you know, support for bigger events. Wow. That's yeah. amazing. Well, people who uh, have been reading our Slow Flowers Journal will have seen that uh, we mentioned you in a couple sort of insights for our forecast for 2023. And that that sort of what led to this podcast is that we just, you, you, I threw out a qu bunch of questions in an email and you responded and told me some of the things that you've been doing at Wild Heart, including these sort of um, health-based and wellness and natural um, kind of plant, plant inspired, um, events and products. And I don't know if you can just sort of summarize where you're at with that. And listening to you talk about your land with so much love, it's a natural extension to see how you're integrating the plants you grow into everything you're doing, uh, personally and professionally. Yeah, I think that's like the journey that plants have taken me on, you know, honestly, in my life, um, because I did, I did really feel cared for by the natural world when I was a child. Um, that was my refuge. And mm. so um, I think, you know, and then just traipsing around for over so many years and now to be so intimate with a place is very different. And I think that's, you know, one of the things that I think I told myself when, okay, you, you received this land, um, 
part of the job is and is to really do right by the place and mm. and honor every stem that comes from this place because i think that when when we look at the industry you know of of the flower industry i mean farming in general but if we just even look at flowers it is it is such a relentless um way that we we that we what we want to take from the land mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. i mean the way the number of stems when i think about all the stems that are grown you think about all that saint john's war and i mean the smilex everything where is it coming from how does it keep who right. are people growing it you know right so you think things. it would be you think it would be finite but it's apparently not you know? right it's you know and it's like still needs to be produced and so for me, that is one of the things that we with the farm and and sort of is is that everything sort of does because we have such a small amount of space. Every flower that we grow, the choices that we make are very specific to. Well, how can this plant also offer multiple purposes? Like a calendula mm -hmm. flower, you know, is going to be a wonderful cut flower, you know, it makes as a dried flower, you know, it's, it's great as well. Like the petals can be used and eaten in salads. Um, it can be used as a skincare product because it's really good for healing the skin and so many different levels, but it's also an amazing gut healing plant. Hmm. Wow. So, um, yeah. So like, that's just one example. And, yeah. you know, so that's kind of how we came into, you know, thinking about, and then of course the pollinators love it. So, um, so God, it checks the, all the boxes. It checks all the boxes. <laughs> so we really try to think, okay, we're not just going to grow eucalyptus. If I can go forage a eucalypt, there's like five eucalyptus plants that I know of, in, including Sarah's, you know, and that are within 20 minutes of here that I can keep rotating around and I can mindfully harvest it, you know, and I have mm -hmm. permission. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's so why grow of, it? Yeah. Yeah. Instead of growing it. So that's kind of how we have done that. But I guess, you know, to get a little bit more in depth about um, the other thing that we've been doing is um, so we make a few different kinds of products. We make um, uh, Tulsa, like tinctures, which are basically an alcohol extraction of an herb. Um, so holy basil, um, but then there are also a few other mixtures that blends that, um, uh, that we make. Um, and, you know, that's kind of one of my flagship. I love that holy basil. It's just a beautiful plant. It doesn't make a great cut flower, but often what I'm doing in my CSA is I, if I offer Tulsi and, you know, holy basil in it, I say, look, this is going to wilt pretty fast, but you can just dry it out, you know, enjoy it for a day or two, dry it out and then make it into a tea. Mm. So, um, so you're I'm educating really... your customers about sort of the, the visual beauty and the, uh, natural wellness component of, of one variety that you're growing. Yeah. So oftentimes, you know, sometimes we say, yeah, your whole bouquet can be turned upside down and dried and you can make, you know, vinegar extracts out of it and that sort of thing. Wow. So, you know, that's another way is like, honoring the life of the plants, you know, I think is just a really important mantra for, for me, um, you know, just that, you know, okay, this is the cost of growing something to the land, to our own bodies, to, you know, what it takes with the water, you know, that's so precious here. Um, you know, we have to kind of find a way to make the, the help the flowers live multiple lives. Yeah. And so that's what we, that's we end up doing. And so right now I'm really also um, with the healing is of the flowers. I mean, every flower does have like its unique, subtle healing qualities, whether you, as a flower essence as well, which it goes back to very, you know, early times that, you know, basically you're just making an infusion in water and sunlight. And hmm. it's just a very subtle, emotional, um, energetic boost that the flower offers you. So after our flood here, we made a daffodil essence and the, because the daffodils were honestly, it, it, I mean, basically every year I buy a couple hundred daffodils of some different fun, double, weird, fun, smelly, you know, all the types. Mm -hmm early, late, you know, so we now I, you know, we have a really nice mix of daffodils and they were just cheering us on. It just felt like they were just, they stood right back up after the flood. Wow. I mean, we were amazing. under a foot and a half of water and they were just plastered down and their faces were dirty, but they <laughs> sprung back up. And I was just like, okay, these need to, we, these are our medicine right now. 
And I, and I looked it up because I kind of kept feeling that, you know, I mean, I think as florists, you know, as flower growers, we do feel the energy of the flowers. Yeah. Like yeah. they are so uplifting, you know, yeah. and, and they do offer us those things. And I mean, the person um, Bach who started flower essences, um, he was a studied chronic disease and he found that, you know, a lot of chronic disease comes from these emotional patterns that mm. are, are blockages that make us wow. sick. And wow. that flowers help us get beyond that. Wow. You're talking about something that's been like centuries old, this, this yeah. research. 1800s. Wow. He was out gathering the dew from flowers and making it into medicine for his patients who were really sick in England. Wow. Uh, you <laughs> referred to the flood. So let's just talk about that. Is this been your, this was just last month, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is, the spring equinox. <laughs> oh my goodness. Was this just your... Uh, worst weather incident since you've lived at a wild heart? Or I mean, is this like a seasonal thing that just everyone's kind of expects and is used to? Well, it's interesting. We actually had a flood last fall as well. And that one was our house, which is actually on high ground. So wow. we are located in the floodplain. Beaver Creek is across the street from us. Um, so only like 500 feet away. Um, but we're, you know, so it basically what happened um, this, the, this spring was that our watershed is Flagstaff and that was basically covered in snow. I mean, they've gotten record, I mean, 15 feet of snow or something crazy like that wow. I mean, record a snowfall with a warm day and or two warm days with rain so rain and rain and rain on top of snow and normally i mean Ugh. yeah it was nine feet at the gauge usgs so it just pummeled us and it pummeled i mean we are lucky at this time it didn't hit our house um it hit my flower cooler our just our she shed um and it you know, no other buildings were impacted. It was just basically like mud in here and we had to clean everything up and then oh. our crops, you know, yeah. um, in on the acre, the acre, the quarter acre were all submerged and they were submerged for almost two full days uh, in about a foot and a half of water. And all the soil is, was there. The plants were there. I mean, I thought the worst, I mean, a whole log that is, I mean, was, this giant tree that we had to cut down that was sawed in half and all these rounds that we had around our fire pit floated away. It was like a river. We had to wow. evacuate. I mean, it was crazy. I thought the worst and I, and the, they all broke through the fence luckily and was, were able to kind of like let the debris, you know, because we share basically the other side of the floodplain with, with Beaver Creek, because is what I realize now. I mean, you're sitting here, it's like <laughs> the Creek's over there. Well, the Creek probably used to be over here thousands of years ago. Got it. You know? So it's natural course might be on the other side of your property, but those daffodils, that's just such a resilient story. Like they, they endured standing water for two days, plus just this flooding kind of motion and and where you were still able to make tinctures out of them at the end once you started digging out of the of the aftermath of the flood yeah oh. yeah and it was like and it was it was so good i mean i do want to share with your listeners i mean we host woofers here willing workers on organic farms yeah even though we do have you know some employees and you know and i'm really lucky to be able to hire employees now um last year was the first year that i did that um this is our fourth season so it's it's it takes a lot to kind of get to that point you know right um and the the i mean having we had two woofers here and i mean they literally were just so amazing because we all had to evacuate so i mean and they were like living in their cars or a tent or their rvs and it was really scary, you know, yeah. and so going through that, you know, having these people with us and then we evacuated to one of my CSA members, <laughs> like, higher land, all of us like in our driveway and like for two nights. It was so oh sweet. My, oh, my but, goodness. But, you know, it's um, it, it really is like the woofers really make our world here. Um, so much of a, of a, a really interesting and wonderful place because what, what we're see, starting to see is that, I mean, this land does 
innately have like a magical quality to mm. it. I think just because of the where it's located. And like I said, like these trees aren't everywhere. Yeah. And so special you know, having and now we have a pollinator habitat. So it's like monarchs are flitting around and you have, you know, trees blooming of all kinds and birds and, and that sort of thing. So, you know, having the woofers and like literally, I mean, we had just done all this work and it was washed away, literally. Wow. And the wow. next day, I mean, they're just rolling up their sleeves. Well, what and an introduction to flower farming that they got to experience, <laughs> you know, that, okay, this isn't just skipping through the, you know, the wildflower meadow. This is, this is the grit that is needed to succeed in this profession. That's yeah. And just to just sobering. It is. It's sobering. And I think, you know, what a lot of us are finding um, with farming and during this really dynamic change that we're in is that these things are more extreme, these events, and they're more frequent. So yeah, yeah well, we might have had a flood every five years. Well, now we're going to have a flood in October and then we're going to have one in March. And I don't know if we'll have one again, you know, I mean, when the next one is, but it's also helps me start. I think in a lot of ways, I'm grateful for this flood because it showed me before I do too much more. I mean, Deborah, honestly, I, that morning, since it was spring equinox, I called our real estate friend who's, who helped us with this and had a verbal agreement with the owner to, to, that he said he would sell us the land, but I didn't know how much to offer him. So I said, can you research this for me? And literally two hours later, she was texting me, I'm on it. I'm looking at it, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, hold the phone. It is like flooding, you know? <laughs> yeah. I don't know what I'm buying here. <laughs> I don't know what I'm buying. So honestly. This is for like, that other part, the other parcel that you farm yeah, on. I mean, yeah. our land flooded as well, um, but it was primarily, our, our land is about half in the floodplain. So okay. wow. a lot of our like high tunnel is out of the floodplain. Mike's off. Mike's office was a little bit impacted. So like half our farm is in the floodplain. Our house is up like up high, but we got flooded from behind because uh. of adjacent land. So it's just very interesting, you know, to, to deal with these challenges. And for me, it was like, I, because I'm a no-till farmer, it was really encouraging to see that all the soil was there. Right. That I picked up on that when you mentioned that the, the st soil and the plantings were, I, I don't know, just had this connection to either excellent root systems or just the way that you have not tilled. So you've not disturbed all of that native soil maybe helped, right? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. It's amazing. Well, I, I had, I didn't start out by saying that Kate is filming a video tour of her farm to share with us. So it will either be at the beginning or the end of this conversation. We'll figure that out later. Hang in there with us listeners and viewers. But um, you have a couple things coming up later this year, actually pretty soon, a, a really fun event I want to talk about. And then um, you have a reading you're going to share with us before yes. we wrap up. So um, tell us about this uh, collaboration you're doing with an art, another arts group. Yeah, so um, the 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 festival is called um, Art X, and it's an inter. It's basically uh, it's through the creative um, creative uh, Flagstaff nonprofit, which is an arts organization in Flagstaff. And their whole concept was to bring together. What if we had this in invited all of these proposals? They they basically got funding from the arts to invite all of these different realms to come together with proposals to pair them all over downtown Flagstaff in one weekend. Oh my goodness. You basically That's like, you know, just this, this to create this energy around what is X, X meaning exponential potential. And also just the intersection. The too intersection. Of, yeah. yeah. Of say, so for our proposal, we're called, we called it. And so this is, you know, and we, we were talking about Terry yeah. and happy, the happy vine. So Terry, you know, Terry's whole thing is cultivating the 21st century flower power. And so we do that together often, you know, in these types of events where we can really showcase local flowers and we can really get our creativity to 
um, to reach, like to have content behind us. So this blooming from the ashes concept that um, I came up with Terry and another friend who's an ecologist and a, a former collaborator with me and artist and aerial pole dancer um, that we are bringing together sort of these concepts to really examine sort of the the reality of climate change and fire in Flagstaff mm. and like living in this time where we're actually, you know, um, we're, we're looking at a legacy of how we've treated the forest. And now we're in this really ex acute stage of li living with the fires, living with the aftermath of the fires, the loss, the grief, the challenges and how can we bring the community together around that with flowers, poetry, song, dance, and, and really kind of tell that story. So we have like six acts of these aerial dancers on a, on a pole at this main stage theater, the Orpheum Theater. And um, we have a poet who is a friend who's a street poet who I met in Santa Cruz when I was farming. And like we've had these fun little interludes just random and he also wrote a poem for molly when she graduated from you know her uh graduate degree so it's really fun that kevin devaney is involved as well so he's going to be our mc so we're going to basically create this flower installation on the stage to help you know and an altar and a you know a whole I mean, it's, it's going that sounds on. sounds crazy. It's crazy. It's I, crazy. I, I was starting to think, how can I get photos of this and do a story about it? But I feel like maybe it needs to be like still photography won't do it justice. It needs to be well, filmed. The good, yeah. The good thing is, and I, I hope we will be able to share this with, um, with your community because um, it is going to be filmed by Ardex. And so we will get some live, hopefully some footage. Of oh my it. gosh. Oh, because let's plan on that. Yeah, we're really hoping. Um, and it's like that trusting the faith, the faith of like, I'm even a nursery is like is helping us with plants. So we're going to have actual live plants. And the whole idea is we're going to put some live plants and trees in the audience. So people are in the forest so that we really blend the stage. And then we're having fire twirlers to help tell the story. And yeah. It's, oh, my gosh. I mean, it's just cool when you get all these. And it's, so that's the whole thing, you know, when you get these people together, um, then, then the ideas just really, they do bloom. They do become exponentially more interesting, you know? Well, and, and it's just, it's just who you are, Kate, you are committed <laughs> to community and committed to place. And, you know, it's just, you're an artist. So it's all, it's lovely to see it all come together. What are the date of that or the weekend? I think it's May 24th. Okay, That's great. Scary that it's coming up so soon. Right. Well, we're going to share the the uh, link and other those details in our show notes. I was just thinking too when you said Santa Cruz uh, about the essay you wrote about selling flowers for Valentine's Day in Santa Cruz that we published oh several years ago. I'm going to share that too. Oh, your, thank you. Your yes. writing is amazing. It's just what a what a I, I can picture that exact moment when when of of the way you described that <laughs> depressing experience and what you drew from that. So yeah, it, I mean, it will, I it will resonate it, with people. Yeah. I think it will, because I think a lot of times we have these past lives that we don't understand sometimes like they're, they feel very meandering. Like for me, it does feel very meandering at times. Like I'm, what am I doing? And I mean, but art has always been, and writing always has been yeah. there as a thread, you know, and, and flat like earth, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's like the things you do sometimes and you're like, how is this going to relate to my life? But yeah. Okay. I am going to be unloading a semi in an alley full of roses. That's just in, in Las Vegas, you know. Oh, was it Las Vegas? Okay. I um I often say to myself, it I don't know why this is happening now, but it will be revealed to me at some point in the future why I had yes. to go through this experience. And I guess that's uh, a better way to live than just feeling like woe is me, <laughs> you know, right. when weird stuff happens. Exactly. You're uh, like, okay, well, this will make a good story. Sometime. Yeah. Well, I want to leave enough time for uh, your okay. video. So um, let's let's wrap up with what uh, a reading you thought you would share, which I think is so appropriate. Let's putting us into the 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 idea of accepting muses from a lot of different art genres. Yes. Yeah, so this is from this book 
the Journals of May Sarton, journals, uh, Journal of a Solitude. And I opened it up. This is the first entry, and it's the second paragraph. And she's a gardener. She's a poet. And she's talking about it's September 15th, and it's in New England. And so she's talking about the last bouquet of the season. Hmm. On my desk, small pink roses. Strange how often the autumn roses look sad. Fade quickly, frost browned at the edges. But these are lovely, bright, singing pink. On the mantle, in the Japanese jar, two sprays of white lilies, recurved, maroon pollen on the stamen, and a branch of peony leaves turned a strange pinkish brown. It is an elegant bouquet, shibui, the Japanese would call it. When I am alone, the flowers are really seen. I can pay attention to them. They are felt as presences. Without them, I would die. Why do I say that? Partly because they change before my eyes. They live and die in a few days. They keep me closely in touch with process, with growth, and also with dying. I am floated on their moments. Mm. What a beautiful universal truth. Thank you so much for reading that. Um, yes. <laughs> I, I, it's just great to feel grounded in uh, why we do what we do. And yes. uh, this isn't just an enterprise to pay the bills. Yes, it's that, but it can't be just that. It's got to have this deeper kind of mission and meaning and purpose. And I sense that so much in what you're doing. Thank you so much, Kate. This has been a beautiful conversation and oh, I can't wait to you. share it. <laughs> thank you so much for having me, Deborah. It's been you bet. such a pleasure. Oh, I know. We could just keep going, but we'll stop for now. <laughs> Take care. And I'm so excited that you have the video to share. And we'll we'll edit that into the final uh, project and or product. And um, good luck with your event. That sounds really wonderful. Thank you. Hey, that was really a wonderful conversation. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm so glad you were with me on that. I'm going to pop up the video now that Kate shared with us. Hang on one sec. Here we go. Okay, here's a little golden hour tour of Wild Heart Farm. We enter the gate here, and as you can see, we have some pretty big trees. This is our little flower lounge. That's the she shed. This is our flower cooler you can hear humming along. And then this is the uh, neighboring land that we were talking about. This is a, about a third of an acre that we're farming with a custodial agreement, which we hope to buy. So you can see we have this really awesome tree canopy going on. And we've got kind of a circular garden here that we, it's our three sisters. So corn, squash, beans, all five sisters really, amaranth and sunflowers. And then this is kind of our big garden growing area. We've got the dahlias that are overwintering and this is our ranunculus crop. So all of this was underwater on the spring equinox about three weeks ago. These lysianthus are just kind of coming back, but nothing was lost. And if you can <coughs> see, like the cilantro looks so happy. All these scabiosas really bounced back. Delphiniums, calendula, some nasturtium. And we have kind of a macro green plot here and the garlic, heirloom greens, more ranunculus. And that's kind of the snapshot here. We love doing these tunnels and then growing pumpkins over them. So that is something we're going to move to the outside of the spiral. Yeah, so that's kind of the lower half of the farm. All of this was underwater. Yeah, about a foot and a half. So pretty crazy that these guys were flattened and bounced back. Okay, here we are in our high tunnel, which I believe is about 20 by 36, <laughs> but I'm not exactly sure. There's our little farm dog. 
to YouTube. But we have it laid out to maximize the number of things we can grow in here because uh, I like to grow small successions. And in the for the most part, we have, so this is a lot of our fall planted or winter planted crops like iris and lilies, ranunculus. We have a cover crop here of oats. We have overwintered lisianthus, which we have found is very productive and starts about a month before our regular lizzies, which we have planted our lizzie plugs here. We have some snapdragon plugs and then we have the, well, this was an, a, just a lettuce crop and some arugula that's already gone. Um, here's our spring ranunculus, which we planted here in October and November. We have sweet peas just growing up against the back wall. And this is a really healthy overwintered ranunculus. I mean, sorry, not ranunculus, lisianthus. So we're really looking to perennialize as much as possible. These are anemones. Um, we do the raised bed no-till tulips. So we planted about 650 tulips in that box and they're coming out now. And then this is kind of an interesting situation here. We have these crates that were started in 2021, I believe, and now they're in their um, second, third season growing um, essentially ranunculus, some overwintered iris, and um, or organ organithallium, which I'm just trying, and it is coming up here. I'm trying to see if I could perennialize this. So I stack these crates just in the back here behind our high tunnel, and then I pick it out in October when they start coming back up again. I put them back in the greenhouse, and then they bloom, and they're getting bigger and bigger every year. So it's kind of an exciting program for me and thinking about how I can continue to work on this perennializing of the crops that we feel like we have to buy every year. So on the ends here we just have some herbs, borage uh, that we're cleaning up. And that's the high tunnel. So here we are at our up garden raised bed. This is an area that was here when we bought the farm in 2020, in the spring. So I decided to keep it because I just wanted to hit the ground. So they're just raised bed planters. And my first season in 2020, I just grew there and in the high tunnel because that was the only place that was really protected from the javelinas and it worked. I was able to, to grow a lot of flowers. So you can see this is kind of our bio-intensive style. All right, I'm gonna introduce you to our flower cooler here, which has received a little upgrade recently. So now we have some really nice countertops. We turned this shed into a cool bot and we're able to basically insulate it we have an air conditioner going in here and then we can basically use it as our workspace because we are in the desert and it gets really hot here. Okay, a little more detail on the flower lounge. So this is where we do all of our flowering. And that's kind of a kitchen slash lounge work area. We do have a woofer camp and the can use that kitchen. This is the she shed, which is kind of more of a crafty space. Packaging area. This is where I do all my dried flower stuff, but I store a lot of the vases in here. So that really is a good space. And then we've just over time just started making these little gardens around the trees with the daffodils and the tulips. There is kind of where we're putting our peonies. We've got a lot of golden columbine in here, native. Peonies are looking really good. This is gonna be our third year for peonies, which is really exciting. Um, and then here's our orchard area and kind of our hangout, our dance floor, yoga spot. 
and then this is the pollinator garden which we built in 2020 and we got federal funding from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to do this for conserving monarch habitat and it's been really amazing to watch the evolution of biodiversity come to our farm from this being just a bare slope and turning into really an overgrown mecca of all kinds of different flowers and nectar sources, a lot of different Asclepias. Um, down here we're waiting to see the first of the Phacelias are going to be opening here which is also, these are all cover crops under the orchard trees and then I cut the flowers when they're blooming and put them in bouquets, which is what you're supposed to do with cover crops, but it's always really hard to do. So, cause I hate cutting flowers of any kind. It's just like always so hard to cut them and end their lives. So this is where we're putting a lot of our little succulents. We're working on this um, in these like little rock outcroppings. And then here is, Say this is our main perennial area, which I feel like this is our fourth season and every year we do another garden. <laughs> so, cause it takes a lot to establish a garden, especially when we have perennial weeds. We have a very tenacious ground cover here that is called Bermuda grass. So all of this was Bermuda grass. You can kind of see it in the distance over there. And so I just do a combination of covering with the billboard tarps for six months at least, then growing a cover, sheet mulching, growing a cover crop, and then um, going from there to plant perennials. So this is gonna be a rose garden. So this is last year's roses. I think we have about eight roses in here. And then we have peonies over there, daffodils, and just some other like solidago and lisianthus that were uh, perennializing and yeah just this is where I just throw, let all things go to seed too like Dara is coming up like crazy I think I'm finally gonna have the um, Lunaris what is that um, money plant so that's really exciting Auric coming up um, this is our little Barbie greenhouse it's just very small but it works for the bare bones you know of what we're doing Obviously, just a little shelter and some heat mats and a fan and you're in business. And this is um, an area that we just started this year that we um, are making this our wildflower meadow. So this is, but we also have like a little rose garden. So I just got four David Austin roses. And yeah, so this is going to be a mix of natives. We're starting, this is our greens patch just to eat for now. And then we'll turn that into something else it's always hard to find space to grow food as you can as I'm sure you all can imagine um, oh there's the peacock he's up in that tree roosting so we have about 18 different kinds of fruit trees this is an old pear that was probably here almost a hundred years ago and nectarines um, peaches, plums, apricots. I love the fruit trees. I love training and pruning them, but also I love the branches. We use a lot of the branches in our spring flower designs and we saw in the florists and then you, s you can see this is our house and we'll take you up to the very end and you can see these these are young apple trees that are just fruiting this year. And this is kind of the overview. And that's a wrap. Sun is setting. Nice spending time with you all. That was beautiful. Thank you so much for joining us today. <clears throat> you can find the replay video of today's interview and the bonus farm tour that Kate filmed for us at slowflowerspodcast.com for episode 607. I'll also share more photos of Wild Heart Farm and links to some of the resources that Kate and I discussed. <clears throat>
I want to thank our supporters who bring this show to you. This show is brought to you by slowflowers.com, the free online directory to more than 850 florist shops and studios who design with local, seasonal, and sustainable flowers, and to the farms that grow those blooms. It's the conscious choice for buying and sending flowers. And thank you to our lead sponsor, Farm Girl Flowers. Farm Girl Flowers delivers iconic burlap wrap bouquets, and lush, abundant arrangements to customers across the U.S., supporting U.S. flower farms by purchasing more than $10 million of U.S.-grown fresh and seasonal flowers and foliage annually. Discover more at farmgirlflowers.com. And thank you to Cal Flowers, the leading floral trade association in California, providing valuable transportation and other benefits to flower growers and the entire floral supply chain in California and 48 other states. The association is a leader in bringing fresh cut flowers to the U.S. market and in promoting the benefits of flowers to new generations of American consumers. Learn more at CAFGS.org. Thank you to Store It Cold, creators of the revolutionary CoolBot, which you just saw in Kate's video. It's a popular solution for flower farmers, studio florists, and farmer florists. Save thousands when you build your own walk-in cooler with the CoolBot system and an air conditioner. If you don't have time to build your own, they have turnkey units available. Learn more at storeitcold.com. And thank you to Red Twig Farms, based in Johnstown, Ohio, Red Twig Farms is a family-owned farm specializing in peonies, daffodils, tulips, and branches, a popular peony bouquet by mail program, and their Spread the Hope campaign where customers purchase 10 tulip stems for essential workers and others in their community. Learn more at redtwigfarms.com. The Slow Flower Show is a member-supported endeavor, and I value our loyal members and supporters. If you're new to our weekly show or our long-running podcast, check out all of our resources at slowflowerssociety.com. I'm Deborah Prinzing, host and producer of the Slow Flowers Show and the Slow Flowers Podcast. Next week, you're invited to join me in putting more slow flowers on the table, one stem, one vase at a time. The content and opinions expressed here are either mine alone or those of my guests alone, independent of any podcast sponsor or other person, company, or organization. Thanks so much for joining us today, and I'll see you next